<laughs> All I want to do is pummel people for charity. I just want to give away some money and punch some people in the face. And simply because I'm a I'm a philanthrop I'm a philanthrop I'm a phil phil I'm phil some phil some frappe phil some I'm phil silvers I'm phil phil silvers <laughs> Sergeant Bilko Salehi <laughs> get ready right away I just I'm selling it I'm selling the idea to people because I could sell shit to a shit machine <laughs> Good show. I almost said she sells she sells by the seashore <laughs> she sells she sells by the throat seashore her name is Sally. All right, before we get started, Salehi, do you know who Mike Tyson is? What's the code to get to Tyson? Oh, are we, are we talking about the video game? Yeah. yeah. I have, I have yeah. no, I know, I never played that video game. Pun, was it Punch Out? Mike yeah. Tyson's Punch Out. Yeah. Yeah. Never got a chance to play it. 007-373-5963. Nope. No Major Garrett. Major Garrett's tomorrow. We're no Major Garrett. We are recording with Major Garrett tomorrow. John, supposing. I get worried anytime I, we talk about guests, upcoming guests, before we record with them. I'm afraid they're not going to show up even via Zoom. Like I just today. Say that again? Like today, because Major Garrett was... On no, Major my... Garrett is not today. Today I is not... I have several texts saying... No, that. you're... All right, Scott, I'm going to fill you in on what John's been doing to me. Every once in a while... I become 85 years old and can't remember if I've told John something, but I want to make sure that he remembers because before COVID and everything, his schedule was uh, very difficult to break into. But now he pretty much, anytime I say, are you available? He'll say, let me check my schedule. He'll take about five, six, seven seconds, and then I'll get a wide open. <laughs> so, um, I texted him about Major Garrett, and then it evolved into not being Major Garrett, the CBS White House correspondent, who's supposed to be one of our guests this week, also Shaquille O'Neal. I thought sure he was you. Fox. No, he used to be Fox. Oh, okay. And he's Scott, been gone for a while. Yeah. He's, he, um, he got a complete dressing down by Barack Obama years and years ago when he was at Fox. Like, just crushed. But he's also the guy who got me into the White House to walk around with Sean Spicy, who's a tiny little man who lives in a mushroom house. Yes. Um, and uh, as, as we're in the White House, it, it, Major wasn't with us, but uh, as I'm in the office in the White House, right next to the Oval Office, you could just see Sean Spicy going, oh God, I hope they don't hear us. Oh <laughs> like he was ready to be, like Ed was, people were- is Sean Spicer now building Christmas villages in Arizona? You is have that a wonderful, this is a wonderful, <laughs> this, is, this is a I miss lovely, him. you know who would live at the top of this mountain? My former <laughs> boss, my former boss, Donnie, Donnie Trumpsky. So uh, he's, he's, I think major is the most, um, unbiased reporter he just seems he's the really, best he just seems really really good so excited about that Shaq is supposed to be recording with us this week as well we're just going to really also unbiased you. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I could go either way just like Michael Jordan remember when Barack dressed him down that was wrong oh, yeah <laughs> let, let me be clear uh <laughs> Shaq uh, uh, this is uh, a lot of people are saying that you you have uh, uh, crossed eyes but you don't just answer the question. Can you fix cross ties to the healthcare program? <laughs> Look. Also coming up, we got Harlan Coben, um, author of um, uh, The Boy from the Woods, which is a bestseller right now. And it, John, how far did you get into the Netflix show, The Stranger? How far? We finished it yesterday, which I am not a binge guy. And uh, I probably got through five episodes over the weekend. I'm bad at binging, but that thing is good. It, and uh, it, yeah, it really grabs you. It's, it's smart without being uh, too smart for itself. And my mm -hmm. favorite part is it does not cop out. It, it doesn't tidy up. It doesn't, it doesn't cop out, which it's very cool. Loved it. I, I thought it was really good. Really liked oh, it. And it wouldn't have oh. happened had I met him on this. Yeah, I think we're going to start. Uh, hold on, Scott. I think we're going to start a book club. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> We're going to start I want like an Andrew Luck type of, but an audio book club. Cause I, I, like we talk about in that episode coming up, I can't read at all. Cause my mind and John says the same thing is our minds just wander and create neighborhoods of make-believe. Yeah. Um, 
but uh, go ahead, Scott, what you were going to say. So I am not a binge person either. And I, I had mentioned during the interview with Harlan, how great I thought that show was to the point where I then watched the, the show safe, which he did about three years ago uh, with the guy that plays Dexter. And it is great too. I mean, yeah. these shows are great. They're, they're not, they're not pretentious. They're not the wire. I'm not going to tell you they're the wire or anything. They're the perfect mix between really smart, but very entertaining. And there's no phony, like John said, there's no parts at the end where you're like, that's a stretch. That's right. impossible. You know, we live in a life where everything is a stretch. People are now, they're like, oh, that couldn't happen. It's happening. Yeah. Everything that's going on could not happen. And now it's happening. So if you watch a show and it seems like it's a little extreme, but it actually could happen, just enjoy it. Don't wreck it. It's, a, it's like I always say, we're living in a simulation and the programmers got bored. We jumped the shark <laughs> and now everything, you know, I'm president and I'm going to find a virus in China, the Wuhan crew. You know, it's so... Yeah, I know what you're saying. I, I'm going to go one step further. I got into his audio book. Now, I, I had something else going on, um, was watching, uh, I tried to watch Safe and The Five, but uh, things were going through my head and I don't know, I didn't get into them yet, but I did get into his audio book, the, the Boy from the Woods, and got completely engulfed in it and finished it in a couple of days. And I wow. have finished it. Yeah, yeah. So I got it. Now I got The Stranger on audio book too. And I want to say this, uh, Stephen Weber the guy from Wings, we talk about this in the episode coming up. Steven Weber reads that book, and it is, he is so good at it that there are a couple characters in there that I don't buy that it's him anymore, and I completely buy into him being somebody else. And now I'm listening to the other one, um, The Stranger, and it's a good book on tape uh, or audio book, but it's not the level of Steven Weber. And I also am in the middle of uh, Gridiron Genius, and Michael Lombardi read that himself. And yeah. he should, we're, I'm going to tell him he's got to get Steven Weber next time. So, <laughs> <laughs> he does. He yeah, does. He, he's, he's, he's fine, but he sounds like a guy who isn't an audio book reader reading right. a book. I mean, it's, right. it's good. And I'm, I'm listening for more of the information than anything. But I was so blown away by Steven Weber yeah. that I'm like, oh, crap. Everybody seems average or less than that to me now. So I drive, you know, you know to everything. Unlike Frank, you know. I don't have the budget to fly everywhere. So I've driven 80% of the time. So I constantly listen to books on Audible. Before that, they were on CD to the point where the cassettes. And so I know all the, uh, the narrators that do a lot of these books. And the one thing that can be irritating to me is if you can't nail the voice, like I remember listening to this one. It was like some kind of gangster book fiction and the guy, he sounded like he was a 60 year old guy from Boston and he was trying to nail like the voice of a 12 year old African-American girl. Right. And he's trying to do that voice. And it was just like, dude, this don't try. Steven just Weber does a voice in here. And I, um, I don't think they ever describe what the guy looks like, but he's ex-military and I can see the mustache and sunglasses. Oh. I mean, it's so well done that I'm going, and he does a cast to do a couple female voices and they're pretty good. And there's some um, New York Jewish kind of accent stuff too. That's, that's good. But when he hits this uh, guy, uh, uh, the former military guy, unbelievable. And the, that thing just twists and, and runs around all over the place. So Harlan Coben coming up. Um, it's, he was great. Yeah. It's a different kind of episode, another edutainment kind of thing. Uh, everything on YouTube as well. Now, I just want people to know that. Go to the YouTube page. We'll put that on the at Frank Caliendo across the board. Um, Bobby Lee, uh, still that. I, he's an enigma to me. I don't understand how he just drives people. Through. <laughs> it's, I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen it like, uh, like a, a non-Avenger or something like that. <laughs> it's just it's amazing. So uh, what it's I want to get list, Frank. It's his again. Dad's it's his dad's list. That was, the, <laughs> that was the most provocative thing that's ever happened on this show, that his dad had a hundred 
people and animals that he raided. And I still, I can't get past it. It's Here's like what we need to do. We need to have Harlan Coben listen to that episode and write a book <laughs> based on it. And I, as, as you guys will find out, I'm plugging this because, and the reason I'm talking so much about this is because when we talked about Lovitz, people went crazy for the Lovitz episode. This is something I think is really good for non-readers because I wasn't a reader at all. I still don't consider myself a reader, but I, our Harlan actually I texted with him. He said this, he said, um, he said, he's known as the guy who's uh, uh, the author for guys who don't, don't read books. And he really is. Cause it's pretty, I mean, there's there are, all the words I understood. It's not like a text from Holmberg. Uh, there's no French milk toast. Um, milk so um, really good. I, here's what I want to get to now though. Um, John, yeah. When you had your concert this, uh, this past weekend, uh, people don't know, but you are not just a gifted radio guy who does a couple of better than average voices. You are nothing from that. Just, no, I'm just, gone. <laughs> just waiting for the rest. Are, are your gardeners there? <laughs> um, by the way, during the Harlan Coburn episode, uh, John completely distracted by gardeners that we couldn't hear, but he had no idea what was going on half the episode and was mad about the episode afterward because he felt like he didn't participate. Well, I just, I just couldn't participate. I had it muted most of the time, which is fine. Me not participating usually is good for everything, but it was driving me nuts because I was trying to listen. I was trying to, part, I was trying to play along. I couldn't hear a lot of it because there was leaf blowers right here and right here. And they just decided to do it the entire time. So I switched rooms and they moved too. So it was for us. Would you rather have leaf blowers or the fifth of Fuey come in? <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to find a way to get a call back in. Uh, so you're, <laughs> listen, I got no problem for us and stuff. What Ironically, that? that's, and this is not untrue. Most of my yard guys look exactly like Mike Tyson. Really? Which couldn't be more true, yeah. It's my man, Al Smith, his whole family, his nephews and brothers and all of them. And they're awesome, but you look outside and it's like I've multiplied like 12 Mike Tysons to do my yard. It's got to cut these trees over here and don't forget the citrus or I'll come after you, I swear to God. What's really funny is my crew that, uh, that works uh, here, the my landscapers, all sound exactly the same, but they all look like Jay Leno. So it's like, <laughs> hey, wait, cut this over here. <laughs> Gotta get to that citrus before Frank comes out. You know, we hate when we never do it. What's the deal with this? If you see this, have you seen this? I, you know, I think I'd seen him mow his grass one time. I, I'm not saying he's lazy. Uh, he could probably work a little harder on the house. So I always have an impression of my gardener. Can I do, can yeah. I do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. You're doing it now. I'm doing it right now. Yeah. Uh, hey, yeah. Uh, get, yeah. Okay, Susan, I will get to it. Get off my freaking back. That's, that's my gardener. Okay, go ahead, guys. I'm, I love listening. So I always forget that John has so many talents and to watch you do the concert, that always blows me away. Oh. Uh, Scott had tuned in. He'd never seen you before. So first time, John, I Thank told you. him, I'm like, I was yeah, knocked I out. I couldn't believe it. And, and it's on Zoom. So I know that it's nowhere close to as good if you're hearing it live. Yeah, we somehow were just, that guy killed it. Yeah, so explain oh, to people what, how you had it set up. So the band is just kind of a, we do a rock band uh, thing. We're called Sodomizing Linda, but for personal and public things, we're called Holmberg's Undercover. Uh, just, you know, when there's money involved. Otherwise, we're Sodomizing Linda. And uh, um, we, it's just a group of musicians outside of me that are ridiculously good. And uh, then I go on there and honk my mouth for a little while. But they, uh, they set up five different internet cameras and then we put it up on Facebook Who's Live. Who's they? Who's they said it? Our about? drummer, Ryan. Ryan, who oh. is just ridiculous. Cut all the lag out, did an unbelievable job. And I mean, we had zero issues. Um, you know, Where are you guys? You guys are at your own houses? Yeah. And okay. so everybody was in different spots, uh, save one. And uh, yeah, we, we basically didn't have a chance to rehearse because you can't get in groups and we couldn't come together. So... We know a bunch of songs. We tried to get the levels right by the fourth or fifth song we did. Otherwise, it just sounds like one guy harmonizing over another. But we were pretty happy with the way it came out. We raised a lot of money for the Humane Society. I don't know how much quite yet, but a good amount. And we had a blast. It was a ton of fun. And you know, we had our fingers crossed the whole time that the internet wasn't going to do something stupid one way because it would have messed up the whole night. So we did an in-house concert. I sang. All the guys played their instruments from elsewhere. And we tried to put it together. And 
we got lucky for a couple hours, I guess. See, I thought you sounded good. It sounded fine to me from the very beginning, but different people were complaining throughout, like, can't hear this. The vocals are too much. They're too little. Right. I'm like, I didn't hear it's that. Your, right. It's your TV. If you were on a phone, it sounded different. If it was on a TV, if it was through a big surround sound, it would have sounded different, a computer. So we were getting it to where it was just sounding good to us in our ears, and then you can adjust. Because I think it sounds horrible on my phone. It drives me nuts because one thing's louder than the other. But you, you know, you know, when you do impressions and stuff, you're like, Jesus, it sounds terrible here, but great here. I've been, I've been having that issue with yeah. with stuff lately. I'll put something out. If you listen to it in headphones, it sounds completely different than if you're just listening to it on your phone speaker. And then people yeah. are like, that impression sucks. I'm like, you know what? Blocked. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They just don't get it. I don't care when people are like, well, this part was no good. You missed that. Yeah, we. It was a live performance of five guys listening to each other through our, our headphones. Amazing. And there's going to be a, a mistake at least every song. And we had probably two or three. We just looked like, wow, well, all right. Then we just got that out of the way. Yeah, so but how could you not expect that as an audience member? It's almost like if you're going into that with uh, the idea that it's going to be perfect, you're more. And I thought you guys, the one thing I thought was a little tough that you guys were doing, I shouldn't say tough, but that I – that I didn't like, you guys kept saying, uh, you especially kept saying, I know this is, uh, you know, and maybe you had to, because there's just idiots watching and listening. <laughs> but you kept saying, I, this isn't going to be perfect. And it was good enough that if you didn't yeah. get that, it almost like you have to put something on the screen that says yeah. not going to be perfect. So you don't have to say that because people, yeah. I was, I was chiming in and I was saying things like, it's fine. It's good. Don't yeah. worry about it. And then I think, I think I feel the need to say that because we don't know how, what you're hearing. Also, True. like comedy um and i don't know how scott you're doing it um without an audience ambient noise with music covers a lot of errors when you're a live performing band so you'll you'll have the audience screaming and doing stuff or being at least noisy enough or bar sounds that goofs and little errors get kind of lost in the shuffle and that every goof you make or every missed harmony is sitting in someone's living room with an audience of one going oh they missed that one so you're kind of, a, we, we're aware of it. I just wanted to say, hey, we're aware of it. Right. Settle down. I'll, like I said, it's a free show. I'll give some insight for people that have never done stand-up comedy. We don't usually, if you're at a comedy club, you don't usually see anyone past the second row. Yeah. So if you, because the, the stage lights are so bright, that's why if you ever go to an open mic, the, fir you know, the first five people that have never done stand-up before will get up there and go, oh, these lights are so bright. And it's like, don't do that. You're a total amateur when you say that. But when you do a Zoom call, you're really looking at about the same amount of people that you usually can. You're looking yeah. at eight different windows. And when I've done three now, uh, I've got a big one coming up in Milwaukee for a Jewish parent uh, for their school. So, I'm so doing wait, wait, before you get into that, you're doing stand up or you're talking to people? How are you doing this? Uh, first off, do not stand up with a microphone. And do, I've seen it. I've seen people online do this. No, you, like this. You need to be in the window, talk at them, have a conversation, tell stories. Um, it doesn't hurt at the end to go Kevin Pollock and uh, tell a few stories about some people you've met and, uh, and also have questions they can ask you it goes great i didn't think it would it has the weird thing is if you're not doing well with one group and there's 200 people i've discovered oh i'll just flip to the next group who are better laughers i don't i don't hear them because i'm concerned about like i told you the first time i was on a zoom call and some douche was mowing his yard while listening on the zoom call you think the birds are annoying or he was actually mowing the yard as we were trying to do a business zoom call and you know what's worse about that scott just on the other side of that guy mowing the grass was me trying to do a podcast with harlan coben it was horrible <laughs> damn landscapers and he was a heckler and he kept going hey is this all you got scott is this all you got <laughs> man we're really tying this episode together right now Ooh, we're like harlan coben Ooh. yeah all come together at the end. Well, thank you both for that. That was nice of you guys to tune in. How long out. have you? Uh, how long have you guys been playing together? Um, the five that you saw, uh, me and Marty's a guitarist, and Roy is the other guitarist. We've been doing it for ten years, off and on. We probably play four or five shows a year, 
we do like little charity events. We've done stuff um, where I did half my face as Dave Grohl and half as uh, Kurt Cobain and wigged up for both. We did Fuvana um, on the anniversary of Kurt Cobain's death this past last year. And then, you know, we, we have a thing we're working on to do um, a grunge thing where we do five bands, uh, Soundgarden, Stone Temple Pilots, Nirvana, um, Pearl Jam and Alice in Chains all in one night. So we do five songs from each one and I just run off and get switched out. And so that'll be our next big thing. And that's the word casinos want to do that one. So we got to figure out, we got to figure oh, that cool. out. So, yeah. So it's fun. It's, it's dumb fun. And, and we've got a few original songs, but we don't ever play those live because we know, you know, a bunch of 50 year old dudes playing music is kind of funny anyway, but yeah, we've been at it for a while. Every one of those guys. Wait a second. Wait a second. Awesome. The, the, the Rolling Stones. I mean, I, I know yeah, they're they a little have, more well-known. They, they have a catalog. Nothing <laughs> yeah. worse than a bunch of 50-year-olds doing it in their garage and then going, we're going on the road. You're pathetic. But it's just for fun. So long as you keep it in your head that you're having a good time and, and lucky enough have a, a platform to make it kind of a, a cool thing I can do for charities and stuff, I do it just because it's better than, than uh, we get to get drunk and goof around and have fun and scream music and we're not so bad. The, the, the guys that play with me are so incredible. They've been studio musicians and musicians for major bands and stuff uh, and producers for, for real bands. So just getting the chance to be in the room with those guys is, uh, is, a, is nice for me because they let me do it. And so, so far, so good. So it's been pretty great. Who does your singing voice, who do you think, who do people say your singing voice sounds most like of, because you, you do adjust it some but you're not doing impressions no like i can do impressions. yeah like the pearl jam thing if i want to do a pearl jam impression sure. i can do it and then um like nirvana i can do that but for the most part i think it's some sort of combination of of a, a stone temple pilots uh alice in chains kind of thing yeah just a I, agree. Thing. I, think, I think it's just kind of that it's kind of a, a gravelly rock voice but yeah. I always thought Scott Weiland of Stone Temple Pilots was kind of the imp the the musical impressionist of grunge rock. Oh yeah. Because when he that that sec the first album sounded like Alice in Chains. Yep. Sex type thing, and then the second one, he was doing like he sounded like Pearl Jam on one song. He sounded like Nirvana on another. Then they come out and they do like a Beatles type album. Then he's like trying to do David Bowie stuff. It was like, and I, I think singers can. Like Lenny Kravitz, I think a lot of people think his music, he's kind of just, he does an album that sounds like somebody instead of being maybe more creative. But I enjoy that. I, I want to hear stuff that s doesn't sound totally alien to me. That's uh, yeah. what my ears like. Well, yeah, that's like a, a hit song is almost 25% recognizable right off the bat. Yeah. Like there's studies on it. Like, they, like where have I heard this before? And it's because you haven't. It's because it's got some tones to stuff you've, you think you like. So it's an unfamiliar song that sounds good to you, usually sounds like something else you can't place. So yeah, we've had a few where, you know, the impression part comes in sometimes and we'll goof around like that. Well, I did that whole night as Pearl Jam. We redid Pearl Jam's 10 album front to back on the anniversary of that. And I realized midway through that my Eddie Vedder impression uh, only has so, so long before it becomes incredibly tedious. The singing part's fine. But between songs, when he's, you know, I'm gonna get out there. I really wanna, I wanna get the rainforest together and have everyone understand. <laughs> you know, sometimes when the, when the, when the government and the, and you're like, oh my god, these people are at a bar. You've got to stop because in your head, <laughs> you're doing the cadence right and all this, but you've just talked for like a minute and a half. G guess what? It's, 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 it's comedy, and you forget. Oh my god, I'm not doing that right now. That's over. And. Yeah. And they want you to move on. So I had to really kind of speed that part up instead of being, you know, I'm not telling jokes as Eddie Vedder. I'm, I'm being the annoying Eddie Vedder who's all for the environment and then talk about the Cubs and then talk about the guy I got off on the one time we were uh, as Pearl Jam. So I was sitting in the, uh, the stands in Cleveland when uh, the Cubs won the World Series. And uh, I remember turning to Bonnie Hunt I'm thinking, and I'm making up this stupid story. And I'm looking and I see this guy in the front row and he's got his iPad aimed right at me. And the... I mean, the most a million yard gaze is on his face. Like he's looking so <laughs> through me, like just, we know you're not really him. Why do you believe you are? <laughs> and, I, and it hit me so hard. And I was like, all right, uh, 
two, three, four, and you just write the middle <laughs> of it. It's different. Like, so it was John, when you when you go when you go too far with the Eddie Vedder impression, it's not called tedious. It's called credious. <laughs> <laughs> That's just like it's like the dude from what, Scott Stapp. Got it's step very Creed. stappish. Putting a stamp well, on it. You know, they all borrowed from me, Scott. And speaking of borrowing, we all should borrow the idea that he'll go on forever. You got to just cut me off, Frank. Do you, uh, did I ever tell you guys the story of how you were talking, first of all, you were talking a little bit about how you start doing the wrong thing in the wrong setting. So you start to do a little bit of comedy in a music setting in a bar and that it just doesn't fit. Years ago, this is back when my show was on TBS. That it, it was the in between seasons, the writer strike or something like that. My manager came to me and said, um, "Celine Dion wants you to open for her on the road, or the, the Celine Dion crew, or whatever." I, you know, I don't know if she picks it. I'm going to have you, Mr. Caliendo. You be very good. <laughs> you know, it's milk toast. You know how to spend this. Um, so. I said, that's the complete wrong audience. What in the world is going on here? And it turned out they were, they didn't really want me. They wanted an impressionist. I was just the known name. What they wanted was a singing impressionist. So sure. could you imagine me going out there for yes. Celine Dion's audience? And here's a guy who uh, goes near far wherever you are. Boom. I would pay, I would pay to see. Frank's singing impressions, but people would go thinking you're going to do like Harry Connick, but it isn't. It's, it's Harry, John Harry, Harry Jr. Harry Jr. <laughs> <laughs> New York, Hi, New, York. New York. Frank, have you, I mean, I think I've asked you this, but I don't remember ever what your answer is. Have you tried to do singing impressions ever? Or you just, I just no. have trouble staying with the, the beat. So that's... <laughs> Uh, no, really, because I'll get off and it's hard. Real, really good singers, or once you know what you're doing, you don't sing on the notes. You sing a lot between the notes. So True. two notes will play and you come in between those two notes. I have to come in on the note because I don't have the confidence to come in at the right time. Juliet, my daughter, I watch her. She can just do it. She just starts in the middle of it. She'll know when to come in. That's why when you watch American Idol or one of those singing shows, when they're a cappella, they can be amazing. But as soon as you put the music, yeah. they don't know how to match up with the music properly and can't sing to it. There's it, a totally different thing. Yeah, it can drown you. Like when, when you get a band that's really good, it can drown out just a good voice. You have to have a dynamic to it. And some people that do, you just sit and marvel. Like, Jesus, it's so easy for that person to do. And uh, I don't, you know, I never claim that I can just pop in and do that. It's, it's not easy, but it's like, man, when people can do it, and they make the music part of them rather than, like you said, on Idol, when the music just envelops the singer like they're not big enough for it. The room, it's a comedian. The room's too big for them. It's just, it's swallowing them. Um, that's what a band can do. And if it's a good band, it'll eat you fast. So I went to the, uh, to shift uh, gears here for a second, I went over to the, the studio where we would do the, the live show from before, the, the, not the live show, but the podcast from where John and I would sit. And I almost felt like I was in a, a, a like a, a foreign country. It was so <laughs> weird to be non like thinking about doing this podcast not on Zoom. I'm kind of worried about that. Um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good at Well, it just it was such a different feeling because I was cleaning some things up. Michelle has like a little surprise coming up and stuff like that. So I was like cleaning some things up, putting uh, putting some things away back there, and just moving stuff around. And I just felt like, gosh, what a different energy that is that yeah. we haven't had. It's going to be a lot of fun, too, once we get back to that, because some of the audience that's caught on with us during Zoom, which it's exponentially gone up, are going to find that we interact a lot more and a lot differently and a lot more impressions and go off on a lot more crazy tangents oh, yeah. when, when that happens. I, but I was wondering. I've got to tell you, Frank, I'm very nervous about it because uh, I never talked when you guys were together. <laughs> I know. And I've gotten used to getting to talk and I have to go back. Yeah, thanks, Scott. So we uh, will have a very. <sighs> we need to make the podcast great again. Les Scott Long. <laughs> Number one, Les Scott, more Frankie and Johnny, they're lovers. Maybe we should change his last name to short and short is your word of the day. Keep your brakes little. 
So, John, you've been going to the station because you have yeah. a special license to be out and go to work and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 I'm essential, bro. Yeah. <laughs> when that, all that stuff started out happening, wasn't it kind of, it was all kind of weird. And now it turns out, well, people just been going wherever they wanted to anyways. Yeah. Well, like I, we had a, we had my company, we're, we're good, but our company laid off nationwide fired, not laid off a bunch of people Friday. Oh, really? Um, so uh, yeah, this past Friday. So I'm officially in the boat of the right thing to do is what we did. Right. But if they don't have a phase two here soon, I know two people who have had COVID-19 and 14 people who are now out of work because of it. The numbers have done this. And so we know for sure that people without jobs and insurance die. Um, you know, the less money you have, the less health care you usually end up with. So I think this whole switch has to go back. We've got a lot more information now. So I'm looking forward to when we get everything together. I was, the governor was, his office was emailing me regularly and, and letting me know, here's what we do. Thanks for cooperating. And I told him last week, I'm like, hey, uh, we burned down the whole kingdom to save one princess and you're losing. Me. Yeah, um, but that's, it, it, listen, that's a lot of people feel that way. And yeah. I, I'm, I, I'm in the same spot. I'm like, it's, at, at a certain point, it gets to the point where people just can't take it anymore. Right. And can't, can't live this way because they're not going to be able to live. But this is something I texted you about this week, John, or just maybe a couple of days ago, uh, which would be this week. Um, <laughs> actually, in the calendar, it would have been last week, but it's within the week. Right. But Good there's, cover. but uh, it's a it's an it's such an odd situation where you don't know uh, where everybody stands anymore. You don't know what's happening. You don't know it, it, at the beginning. They told us. This feels like Joe Biden at this point. At the beginning, they told us that <laughs> I, they just I lost my train of thought. I got it back. We uh, he wouldn't get it back. I feel I'm dirty just... from that. I'm going to lice all the area. I got to work on the Biden. Biden. Touch him. Touch him. Uh, unless uh, who knows? I, have but, you been working on Biden? By the way, I've been wanting. I haven't ask. really yet. But have you, John? John, have you? No, I'm working on uh, Vice President Obama and Hillary. <laughs> right. We'll get into that in a little bit. Yeah, because that's coming. I think I think that theory, and I have that same. Joey, my son, had that theory too. He's like, Dad, I don't think he's going to make it. I think they're the vice president's going to be if he gets elected is going to be the president. I go, you, we're way ahead of you on this, buddy. <laughs> um, but they told us that it was, and I've heard other people talking about this. I've even heard Colin uh, Cowherd talk about this a little bit. But they told us it was flattening the curve to keep people out, you know, from overrunning the hospitals. But now they've kind of said that's not the issue anymore. Uh, we're just trying to not kill people or not let people die. But that's not what you told us in the first place. So it's hard to understand what to, and I'm still obeying all the rules in, in that, but I, I'm starting to get a little cranky about it and even crankier for other people in tougher situations because listen, I'm, I'm in decent shape right now, but I know that my, the rest is in a selfish way which is where I like to think from <laughs> that if, yeah. if everybody else, starts I to am on that, a podcast. <laughs> get out of it. Ah, get out of here. <laughs> when that's the best part of the podcast, that's an issue. Get out of here. Go shut the door. This is what we're talking about. People have had it with their houses being filled with humanity. Please, everyone do something. We can't keep this up anymore. Find something to do outside of the boundaries of this goddamn domicile. And we're back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm the same way. There's a social responsibility that we all took and I'm proud of everybody for doing it. And now there's a personal responsibility. We know the rules, we know the numbers. We know who's uh, most at risk and we know why we did it. And if the hospitals are, are capable and we can move forward, then we as healthy middle-aged to young people can go about our business not infecting elderly people by staying away from them until this happens. I'm still for the idea of no big sporting events, no concerts, no crowds, but let's be smart. I think we could be in a room and be smart. I think we can all understand that if there's somebody who's got a problem and I live with my mom and she's sick, they shouldn't be doing that. But, so but John, like, like the public school system, 
overall. They're not making the laws and making these rules for us. No. They're making it for people who can't follow them at all that aren't going to follow them anyways. And it's, yeah. it's kind of dumbing down for everybody else. I don't know, but I'm at that point where I'm going, it feels like we're going to start doing a lot more harm than good pretty soon uh, if we're not there yeah. already. I, I can't, I, we got to start digging out of this hole now because it's not going to, it's not going to be a short climb back. And I know, I know really good people who through no fault of their own are now no longer employed. Their careers ended Friday. I'm not that good. But, huh? but <laughs> they were yeah. actually, you know how we, you know how we I yell at my people. child. I, I do a lot of that. <laughs> we fired people at our office based on how well they are doing financially and who could take the blow the best. Wow. And see, that's and a that, weird, now you're, chi- now you're picking winners and losers. You have to, because you can't send, they, they, you know, they, our company is amazing, Hubbard Broadcasting. They picked people based on the ideas like, look, uh, we, I don't want to do this. No, nobody's getting fired because they can't. We're taking a look at how much you make. How close are you to retirement or like, are you okay if like there's a, and they paid them, they gave them severance packages and made them okay. But it was, it was definitely not something done. Like we got to get rid of this guy. He's an idiot. It was a, our whole staff was fine, but we have to make some sort of sweeping move. And when that happened, it was, you know, it's right in my wheelhouse, good friends losing their jobs. I know people who run companies who it's been their life. I know a guy who's 60 years old, who's run a, a, a self-defense gym for his entire life. And in the, he's luckily very smart and done well with his money. But another couple months of this, he loses that job. And at age 60, he's starting something fresh. He's starting something new, not because he wants to. And I know people hit adversity, but it was through no fault of his own. It was not a failure of his doing. And his money is going to try to keep that going. I just don't think that's fair to do when At first, we didn't have numbers. Now we do. At first, we didn't have information. Now we do. Now we shift. And I'm not seeing any shifting. I think our governor here didn't shift properly. He led me to believe there's no confidence in the idea of what we do next is correct, like I was believing for the first month or two. And now I'm like, no, we got to, we're out of sick days. America, we're we're out of sick days. Well, I feel like we started, part of our problem is we started so late. We started a week or two later than everybody else. Yeah. And not to put, not a partisan kind of thing here, but I think when you think about it in terms of a Republican governor, they're going to try and keep business going as long as they can at the beginning because that's kind of their thing, right? So right. I think that got in the way, and, and I think the, the politics of the country gets in the way of making the right decision early enough because yeah. his base is probably going to get on him about that. And I don't think I don't think there was a way to win in this for, you know, no, in, in it California, it's easier for them to, you know, they're more a more liberal state with a much more uh, liberal um, uh, government. Their 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 mayor, the mayor of Los Angeles, the governor, they're all going to go. We got to shut down right now. Well, that's that's more the Democrat side of thinking or the, the left side of thinking where the the. Uh, right side of the the uh, spectrum is going. Oh no no we can't. And it's not so much for uh, because they're religious or something. It's just business. It's they're, they're right. thinking business first. That's what drives them. And you can I'll be go ahead. I'll, I'll be curious to hear like you know when we talk to Major Garrett about this and you know the media's responsibility and you know I was a journalism major, so was he. You know, we came from, you know, we so learned the better. same things in journalism school. He just was way better at it and had much better hair. And so, you know, that's a big part of it. But I, I guess what I, I would speak to, and I've been talking about it from day one, and I have someone in my house who is very susceptible. So I have to treat her like she's 83 years old. Okay. Right. But it depends on where you are in the United States. And that has just not been a media um, that's not been the way the media has discussed it because they're all holed up in their homes around in New York or Washington, D.C., where it's a higher risk area. And some people would get mad when they would hear, oh, wait a minute. You, are you telling me that Wyoming is not having the same rules? Have you been to Wyoming? Right. The biggest <laughs> city is like 100,000 people. And that's 
that's only basically because they're a suburb of Denver. The rest of the whole state is socially distanced in life. Yeah, but they're so, starting to get, they are starting to get some uh, infections there, whatever you want to call them, in more rural areas. I've been reading about that as yeah. well. So it's making its way. Is it because of meatpacking plants? <laughs> it, no, no, I mean, that's a real problem. It's now true. that is a real problem. Are they people flying in from on their private jets from California to, to go to Jackson Hole? I mean, you know, I, I don't know what's going Everything on. Everything you just said there, meatpacking plant, Jackson Hole, sexual innuendo, by the way. <laughs> Dirty. I just Googled both of them on YouPorn. I've got oh, an hour to kill. <laughs> hey, and I'm ready to make it even funnier. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Here's the, you make a good point, though, Scott, that kind of goes back to what I'm saying. If we can say everybody do the right thing and a bunch of people who have the capabilities of going to Jackson Hole to hide out, take their you know, mess with them and travel because they're selfish enough to believe that we don't win the personal responsibility battle by trying to right. lock everyone down. It's, it's just the argument of saying more laws just make the law abiding people have more things to worry about. Personal responsibility is the key. And if we can't rely on it after a certain amount of time, we just have to go in into the fire a little bit. And, and it's, it's frustrating because it seems so easy. Now, the thing that's funny to me is that I'm not a conspiracy theorist. But I wake up this morning, or yesterday actually, and read the headline, you know, uh, murder hornets are in the United States, which to me is like, if they want to go outside, release the murder hornets. It's, it kind of feels like a Monty <laughs> Burns thing. Are they leaving the house? Release the murder hornets. I, I can't help but think that's a billionaire's invention to keep us oh. from thinking it's a good idea to, to leave now. Stay in the house, I... don't go stop. Murder hornets exist. And they used to be called, uh, what were they, Asian giant hornets. And for some reason, when they got here, we changed the name to, you know, a, a terrible Stephen King movie, Murder Hornets, because it's great for the news. But I can't, everything's so sensational, everything's so crazy. I just don't imagine that, uh, that, that anybody's personal responsibilities are just gonna, the, the switch is gonna flip. Coming up next, Murder <laughs> Hornets. <laughs> <laughs> Except on the West Coast, where 60 minutes. I did, a, I did that video this week. I, didn't, I never do Madden Summerall on video, in, uh, on camera. I rarely do it. And I did it for this just to go with Summerall. Murder. Hornets. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. <laughs> so, you wouldn't do the thing I wrote for you, though. You wouldn't do the thing I wanted you to do. I couldn't figure... I, could, I couldn't... I, I just don't think it's going to work in social media, to be honest with you. I think it, okay. it's, it would work here. I think it'll work. John here. is an yeah. expert on social media. Come on, Frank. <laughs> no, you, I've been, Scott. no, in terms of uh, just the uh, Jerry Jones talking about gingers. And I think it's, <laughs> I'm laughing. He can't the whole live thing. without them. He's a he's a ginger vampire. And there's just two. Just, I just, uh, I, I can read exactly uh, what I wrote. For I am an opie. Yeah, don't feel it yet. So it's basically this, Scott, because they signed Andy Dalton, right? right? So they signed Andy Dalton. So I came up with the theory that says, I was uh, sort of forced to let Jason Garrett go. I didn't realize how much I would miss seeing that shock of red hair. So let me assure you that signing Andy Dalton has nothing to do with the situation with Dak Prescott. But I do have a confession. I am an opie chaser. I have a fascination with the carrot people. I'm a gingerbread <laughs> man. Now, it's a completely visual, non-sexual thing. I just need one around because they give me energy. I feed, from their uh, I feed them their necessary tomato soups and juices, and they give me their gingerbread blood as it keeps me rich and healthy. <laughs> Simply, other billionaires have something similar. Bill Gates has a need for people who have a diet exclusively of trick cereal. It's just a thing. We've all got one. And so you that, just kind of. The end was my favorite part. And I think the way you double end it, you, you put an even bigger crescendo. Uh, yeah. This is the end. Is at the end, Jerry Jones reaches into a giant trunk and pulls out a prop. And here we go. And I okay, here, here's. Perfect. 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 Uh, there it is. First off, it's hilarious. I mean, Thank it you. is truly hilarious. I visualize it as we see Frank as Jerry Jones. And then the screen breaks and you are evil Jerry Jones that pops in <laughs> and you're the one delivering that because it's kind of weird and evil where yeah. Frank's Jerry Jones, unless he's uh, 
Jerry Alex Jones. Now, oh. Jerry Alex Jones, maybe I will eat my Jerry neighbor's Jones. ass. I will eat your ass. <laughs> I will do it. I will. I will fry you up. I will put you in a pot with water. Put creamy cheese all over you and enjoy you for dinner. <laughs> I'm an eyeball on my neighbors. I love that he said that. I've been looking at my name. It took him a month. So and for a half people who don't know, it. Alex Jones, the conspiracy theorist, radio, and I guess internet shadow band guy. Uh, <laughs> because I, I did a little Alex Jones thing and people didn't even know who he was because there's too yeah. many wow. stuck yeah, in a sports yeah. algorithm. Yeah. Um, but he's, he's, you know, the frogs are turning people gay. Gay frogs are turning human beings gay and they will turn you into a rabbit. So... <laughs> Uh, then you, uh, where was I going with that? Uh, the, the chemtrails actually got into my head and I am unable to finish this. This is the exact same thing that's happened to Joe Biden when he was probed by the aliens four years ago. But talk, watch it. He just, so he went off on how he will just if eat he, his neighbors. If it turns out, if it ha if he has to, he will oh, end up eating his neighbors. I didn't hear this. I didn't oh, you know didn't, this. That, that's real. Wow. Yeah. It's a real thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and it's funny because the Jerry Jones thing uh, was basically him having to sustain himself off of the redheaded human being. And I just wanted to hear Frank's Jerry Jones, as sweet and as kind as he usually makes him, say that he has an opie fetish and he I has will, to suck I the will, life I of will. him. I, ha I have an opie fetish. I have been. I have been. I've been thinking about him. I have been. And I will, uh, if I have to, uh, 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 devour my backup yeah. quarterback. I did it this morning on the radio and I came up with a theory that Jerry got rid of Jason Garrett thinking he can kick this himself. This, this is, this is a habit he can break. It's like, it's opioids. I called it. And he's, he's going to get rid of it. <laughs> and, uh, and then he's just in a room of dead flamingos. The flamingos are not working. Sign the boy, get me Dalton. I need his blood. Cause he's just got a room and he's trying to drain everything orange or pinky can and it just doesn't fly. It's not the same. So the flamingos would be his uh, methadone as he tries to, but he's got to get back on the opioids. So get me another opi immediately. And it's Andy Dalton for a million a year. Where's David Caruso? You know, well, we talked about that him. too. He, he's hanging in yeah. the back. Uh, he's behind him in a closet, like just barely alive with a tube hanging out of his arm. <laughs> Frank, I think we have a cow. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, why wouldn't that work on social media? I think it's just, I think it's too, as odd as it is, I think it's too smart. Everything I try to do that has any kind of intelligence to it that has, that lets you think outside the box slightly. It, it's, it, especially with the sports people, it's been really, really weird. Twitter's been odd the last week. Twitter went down a week ago and DMs didn't work, and retweets weren't working for a day, and then numbers have been way down in terms of views and stuff like that. They seem to have come back a little bit in the last day or so, but it was really, really weird where I would put out a video that normally would have 5,000 views in three or four minutes. It would have 50 views, and that's just, there's, with 400,000 plus followers, that just doesn't seem realistic, especially. How, why, John, why are you smart? I'd <laughs> like to know. No, why are you smart? Like, because you didn't act like ideas. you don't read that much. How have you absorbed and become a smart person? Uh, TV, I think. I wouldn't even say I'm smart. I think I'm an observant. No, you're smart. Person. You're very I think smart. It's observant. There's a difference between smart and observant. Smart is a person True. who can do stuff. Observant is a person who can look at it and talk about it. Uh, I, I don't know. Observant. You can apply a lot of stuff, but I, I, I can tell you why. And I, this is a. I'm pretty sure this is the reason you do four hours of having conversations about uh, topical subjects every morning, five days a week. And I, you, I can bullshit my way through everything. So it's, yeah, but you're, you're also, you're, you're constantly involved. I was thinking about, I was actually thinking about this the other day, cause it was the same question going through my head. Why does John know so many words that I don't know? <laughs> yeah. I don't. I, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, no, you do. You talk about parts of the brain. I'm like, I've heard that part of the brain. I just didn't know that was the function for it. Oh. And um, so I started thinking about it. I go, well, this is what I've missed over like shutting myself out for the last five to 10 years and not really listening to anything because I didn't like to be annoyed. But 
you have these conversations every day. You get input from different people. For your show, you have to know what's actually going on in the world. You have to know a little bit about pop culture, a little bit about politics, a, 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 quite a bit locally as well. So you have to have all those inputs coming in and it drives you and it, and it gets easier. Like for me, yeah, that's podcast, true. I've started that. to be able to, you know, improvise more and actually talk in some sentences. <laughs> yeah, that's probably something to it, but I, I still wouldn't say, I'm not dumb. I won't say I'm dumb, but I mean, I look at real smart. I've, I've been in a room with people who are actually smart. I know we're going to get back to that as soon as we're allowed to, to leave the houses again. I'll be. In yeah. The oh, yeah. No, I, I, I've been in that room with Frank. Wait a second. You're not talking about me, were you? <laughs> I had dinner with an astrophysicist and a quantum physicist on two different occasions. And you want to feel dumb. Sit and try to have a general conversation. Now, the difference is I don't know that they know anything outside of the realm of their brain focused on the thing they love. But man, oh man, that quantum physicist, you get him on like, so what do you do is a question that he goes off and then starts to explain the inner workings of just about everything. And I was like, I'm an idiot. So I wouldn't say that, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I, I'm an observer. I think Frank's got, I think we all have it. I think everybody's got that I observe and it comes across as smart because you listen. That's a key. Like you, you absorb information and you actually pick things up because you're always looking for something. That is one thing this job's done, radio. I spend my entire day looking for what to talk about tomorrow. So I'm never, I'm never like just not, I'm never gazing off into nothing. I'm always like, what's going on there? What's going on there? And you start to do, uh, it just becomes part of you to observe your surroundings constantly. And it makes you pick things up a little easier. It makes you absorb information better. So I wouldn't say I'm smart. I think I've just got a, a brain that sponges stuff and I can remember how I feel about it. I want yeah. you to get into this. Scott, did you have something? Because I've got, I want no. John to tell the story. And we can wrap up here in a little bit. Um, the story about your bike being stolen, because this, <laughs> so is this during the concert that your bike no. was stolen? No. Um, so Saturday we do our internet concert. I have, I mountain bike a lot because I'm right off like a mile away from a mountain trail. That's awesome. So I mountain bike a lot. I've got I've gotten kind of into the whole thing. So I've over time progressively gotten better and better and better bikes. And uh, a couple of days ago, I left my bike on the front patio and said, uh, I'll get it in the garage later. Um, my cop friend drives through my cul-de-sac and says, kind of brave leaving that pricey bike out on the patio. And I'm like, we got cameras, you can steal it. It would be great to have a police officer stealing a bike. I'll send it right to the news. And he's like, I ah, will keep it. So in my head, I'm thinking, I gotta get that bike in the garage. Um, go through the whole concert thing Saturday night, do my deal, lay on the couch just outside the window on the couch I'm sitting on is the bike. I'm like, I got to get that bike in. I got to get that. And then I'm like, hey, I wonder if my cameras are actually charged. Look and see that my cameras aren't charged. The batteries died. And so I'm like, all right, fall asleep on the couch, wake up, go right to bed, forget. Wake up the next morning, go out front. And there's some children, a child's bike is in my driveway. And I, for some reason, I'm like, that's weird. And my head just does that snap back to where my bike should be, and it's gone. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh my thoughts of putting it away, my lazy ass didn't do it. And uh, so it gets, you know, through the whole deal. So the cops, I called a friend of mine who's a police officer who I ride with, and he's like, I can't believe that. He goes, here's the number you call. So I called, the cops show up to the house, and uh, <clears throat> the, the girl says to me, um, and you can see it in her eyes. Like, I'm coming all the way out here. How much was the bike worth? And I tell her, and she goes, yeah, this is definitely something you're going to want to How much was it? Uh, it's a Pivot, a Mach 429 trail bike. It's about 5,500 bucks. For oh. The, yeah, it's not a cheap bike. No, it this is what's great about it. This yeah, is it wasn't a super high-end bike, but it's, it's up there. But $5,500 uh, puts you into a stratosphere of grand theft. Uh, uh, grand theft. Like, yeah. you're way past oh. You're up into the second level of grand theft. Like, you're stealing... Good stuff. Like there's this, this, it's pretty big. Like a, like five hundred dollars to five thousand can get you. But if you start drifting into, you walked on my property, you know. So it, I'll compound it. So the cop, the girl is. Still Hold on, on, I just have I got a video game in my hand, Grand Theft Bicycle, and it's you <laughs> shooting hookers. Even and better, you're, Frank. And, and you're you're doing and you're doing. Hey, man, never, never, never. <laughs> you're doing like. The, from the concert the other day, I got it. And you're doing some Jerry Jones. I will find you, Ginger. You know, there's, 
I, I haven't got the energy to chase them. I need a ginger now. <laughs> find it, and then we can find the boy. But the, uh, uh, so she says, will you prosecute? And without hesitating, I looked at her and I went, oh, fuck, yeah. <laughs> and, she, and her eyes got like, you will? And I'm like, not only that, I hope that he's got a big, fat, overly emotional mother. The day of his sentencing, we find out that the day he stole my bike was his, the day after his 18th birthday. So the felony stays on his record forever. And his big, fat, overly emotional mother is crying as he's sentenced so I can walk over to her and go, good job on this one. And the cop goes, wow, okay. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not kidding. We're, we're going to put him in jail forever. I hope he never has a job. I don't have the turn the other cheek gene. I don't. Yeah, and, and the best part is he left his stupid bike. So the DNA swabbed it. Oh. And uh, hopefully we can pull that off. And I will prosecute. Are these, like, these are like Bruno Mogli's shoes or whatever. Are, are there's, there's not many pivot bikes out there, right? No, pivots made here in Phoenix, in the Phoenix area. And they're a high-end mountain bike company. They've got bikes that are 25, 30 no, grand. No, no, but I'm saying there, there's not, it's not like it's a Huffy. Like no. if they see somebody on a $5,500 pivot, they're like, yeah. there's four people in the city that you, you know, you can point to. And one of them does, one of these things is not like the other, right. you know? Oh, they'll stick out like a sore thumb if they ride it into the wrong place. I'm going to tell you right now, place. guys, that this, if this mountain bike uh, theft were written by Harlan Coben, it would be oh. an adopted oh. girl who ends up <laughs> stealing that bike and it's tied yeah. into uh, yes. the governor. Yes. And the That's brooder. one of the things I like about Harlan, uh, without giving too much away. Women are just as evil as men in his, in his books and, and movies. Whereas, like, most of the time, it's always men that are evil, and it's never a woman. And they're evil. The, the <laughs> women are evil, just as evil as the men, sometimes more evil. I will tell you this, too. He plays both sides or all sides of politics in his books or his book that I've read so far. Fantastically. You're, you're listening to him go from the left side, the right side and, and going into the middle and getting all these different perspectives where everybody's made to be a hero and a villain all at the same time. Mm -hmm. That is another thing that I, I wanted to say this at the beginning, and this is good for wrapping this up and, and uh, you know, completing the circle of the, this episode, but He's, I, I'm so glad that none of us were as familiar with him as we're going to be by the next time. Cause I asked him, will you come on again? He's like, sure. Anytime I go, I don't want it to be right away. Obviously I want it to be at least six months down the road where we've all read a little bit more or seen a little bit yeah. more of this stuff because the problem would have been, we would have gushed over him the entire yeah. time because, and, I, and not that that would be a bad thing, but we can get a second episode out of it yeah. with, with one of the biggest authors. in the. I, do, I looked at his Instagram page. It's him with Stephen King. Um, yeah. It's I him. Just saw that. We had no idea. Uh, no. And I saw another thing with him and John Grisham talking about his latest book. I mean, it's just, okay. okay. I've just, hey, uh, you know, to, to pump us up a little bit, I watched a couple interviews that he did on that are on youtube that are his most watched interviews he's an author he gets author people interviewing him yeah snoring boring. <laughs> this was a real interview for a guy who played basketball in college and was telling his stories about you know going to the little league world series with chris christie he doesn't get to tell those stories we're just as good as him that was yeah. like his best interview he, he, he texted me later. Out. He texted me later that night about we get into um, uh, talking about. We, we, I mentioned that Stephen Weber sounds a lot like Patrick Fabian. Asked him if he knew who Patrick Fabian is. Patrick Fabian plays a character on Better Call Saul, which we didn't get into. He he really likes that show. I think he he didn't love this season as much as at this point. He's not at the end of it yet. He liked it, um, but he's texting me about. He goes Patrick Fabian is uh what's his name in better call saul um howard howard yeah yeah so he's, he's texting me hamlin. he plays he plays howard hamlin in this i go i know i go we got off on a different track and never got to it he goes oh my god yeah so i think i might have gotten patrick fabian a role in one of his oh, cool. 
I, you know, who knows? I, you know, that's what I'm good for, though. Not getting myself into anything, but I can yeah. get. He's going to listen to the Bobby Lee podcast, and now the boy from the woods going to be Asian. It's. <laughs> but the weird thing is, and Scott, you're right. Like, uh, it was fun to talk to him and not know. I love doing interviews with people where I know a little bit about them because the interview can be just us talking and you can find out who that is. I mean, the frustrating thing Frank deals with and, and when you do impressions and stuff, people want you to do this, do that, do that. And what you've it's said funky. for years, I, yeah, I want to be me. I want to try to express who I am. And I think he kind of shined in that. I, I watched most of that rather than participated. And he was happy to talk to guys about like, yeah, yeah. here's my methods, here's this and that. But I, I also did this. He got to tell stories that were Harlan Coben stories. And I loved The Stranger. I sat through the whole thing. And uh, if, you, if you listen to that podcast that's coming up, uh, I highly recommend getting in on that before you even watch it. Because he, like Scott said, there, everybody's evil to a certain degree. There is nobody, there's nobody above anyone else. Every character is flawed. And we all have this moral standing but if this unravels there's so many what ifs and it's so brilliantly done as far as like there is no evil there's nobody bad there's nobody good they're all something right. there's just some people who are at different levels and i thought it was i thought it was awesome and it was kind of neat because having chatted with him and getting the backstory made it maybe just a little bit better well, that, that, that's that's what makes great you know mini series or or series that are uh, streaming shows is a sh shades of good and bad. When we were growing up uh, in the seventies and the eighties, pretty much everybody that was the good, was the hero was only great. They were yeah. like perfect. Uh, and the bad guys Scott, were only uh, bad. Hold on, no, no, no. The Duke's a hazard. Well, that's true. Duke's a hazard. The good guys that, I think, the bad well, guys. Wait a minute. Which ones, though? Because Bo and Luke had their faults, but Coy and Vance, they were just cousins who came over to help on the ranch and got hooked up with the with the. They were the just good old dogs. boys. Guys, they didn't guys, mean any harm. Guys, Coy and Vance were railroaded. I was probably 10. All I was looking at was Daisy Duke. Yeah, true. True. No, no doubt. Um, no, I'm thinking Hill Street Blues was probably the first show that kind of it was a drama that showed good and bad in the heroes. Um, probably MASH was the first like sitcom that showed, you know, like Hawkeye was an asshole a lot of times, but he was like the star of the show. That's why they were kind of ahead of their times. And well, obviously Archie Bunker, but he was, but, and uh, sorry, so does, uh, does Soleil yet know who Archie Bunker <laughs> is? Probably? We're going to bring him in here in a minute. So let's do it. All right. Soleil, come on in. Hey, fellas. Yeah, we, we talked about Archie Bunker. You don't Bunker always have time. to say hello to us. We okay. know you're here. Okay. I like it, Sean. Thank you. We, Hi, Sean. Feels good. Yeah, hey, that's, buddy. That's what I like to – I try to think so. But anyway, uh, we talked about <laughs> Archie Bunker last time, uh, and uh, I got ripped apart for it. Yeah. So. It hasn't happened yet, so don't worry about it. That's right. The future right. show. What um, do you got? Do you have anybody that you, uh, you missed references? Anything that we? Uh, yeah, so we need the to first find? one. It was right off the bat. Was Phil Silvers? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> you shouldn't know. You should not know that. Yeah, I shouldn't know 50s, that. Right? Frank shouldn't know you that. You should know that. Yeah. yeah. No, you know why we do know that? Because when we were younger, we knew all the reruns. Yeah. We knew all different. We knew our parents' culture. Yeah. Because there weren't enough different stations that they didn't have enough programming, so they would fill. The great early point. mornings when kids would get up with old stuff and in the afternoon and we would watch it after school. Now you can be directly programmed to all the time. It's a totally yeah. different situation. Yeah, there was kids. no chance that my dad ever said, watch whatever you want. If he was home, we're watching what he wanted yeah. to watch. And there was a lot of that. Like, you know, I watched a lot of I Dream of Jeannie and I know why now. My dad was in his 30s. He, he still ah. thinks of Jeannie quite a bit. I didn't know. I'm like, this show's kind of fun, but I know why he wanted to watch it, and I couldn't turn it. Yeah, dads so are either on the bottle or in the bottle, cha <laughs> <laughs> This one I know is going to uh, probably stab John in the heart is uh, Scott Stapp. Not uh, yeah. That's okay. So. Lead singer <laughs> of a band called Creed. Okay. Yeah. 
So um, I actually, I mean, a little off topic. I was the since you did it on Facebook Live your concert. Is it archived somewhere? I would really like to watch it. I wasn't. Yeah, sure. it's on. Uh, it's on ninety eight KUPD's uh, Holmberg's Morning Sickness Facebook page, and okay. you can still watch it. Awesome. Yeah, I'll definitely watch. What hey, link to that? Sean, that was seamless. That was seamless. The way you promo that for John. I mean, Excellent. I, know I appreciate it that. Asked you, that was beautiful. I think it's awesome. Really good. Yeah. Thank you, Sean. Yeah. Uh, Hill Street Blues. That one was a late, a late uh, add-in. Yeah. Cop show. You should know. It, it was the first, like, kind of legitimate. There was there was language in it. They it was like the first show that they had to put like parental discretion is advised before. It was kind of the forerunner to NYPD Blue, which David Caruso came from, yeah. which is another show you wouldn't know. It's the origin of all good police dramas from it from yeah. the point it started on. Uh, prior to that, you just had like some investigator who never missed in a formula. Right. T.J. Yeah. Hooker totally. type garbage, and then this was just like the first time ever. Cops were gritty. The streets were mean. They'd take money. They'd take drugs. They'd make deals. Right. You're, wow, is this how it really is? Because TV's never shown me that before. So, and it had a great theme song. All right. Yeah. I want to re- hold on. I want to redo T.J. Hooker where William Shatner actually is kind of a dirty cop. Oh, that'd be good. <laughs> uh, so I say we just keep the weed for ourselves. What are you asking me, Hooker? You know, uh, Jonathan Franks was on there a lot. As Jonathan a Banks? Yeah, Banks. I said Franks. Jonathan Banks, yeah. He, he was on there. What do you need from me, Hooker? <laughs> <laughs> and he'd you. always have his gun out. And it was always drawn like halfway to the thing. I need you to cooperate with whatever it is I'm asking. <laughs> I don't necessarily, and then he'd throw a pipe at him and run because the gun was like, couldn't, like the pipe would throw him off so bad that he forgot how to use a gun as he, he had a guy at gunpoint, but a pipe would go like, ah, and he'd duck it and then he'd come back, the guy's 15 feet away and he's, he starts running instead. instead of just Too shooting. much metal in one place, our minds. Uh, there is an episode, if you can look it up, of TJ Hooker where Jonathan Banks is, uh, he's got hair. And he sees T.J. Hooker and he's running and they chase each other. And then he does throw something at him. And it's the first time T.J. ever actually did your impression. Ah! And he ducks the thing and then he starts running again. But he actually screams at the pipe or the shoe or whatever is thrown at him. It's a riot. T.J. Hooker's another one you need to watch, the lady. Because yeah. it's the opposite of Hill Street Blues. Do you, know, do you remember the, uh, the Hill Street Blues spinoff? Uh, uh, um, I th- uh, well, hold on. I know what it is. Um, Facts of Life. What's it? That's exactly no, it's right. It's like a musical. Was it the music? No, no, that was cop rock. Hill Street Blues had okay. one. Um, um, they had that one bad cop that was kind of a goof. Uh, I forgot his name, but it'll, uh, Bunsen. Uh, damn it. Honeydew. Bunsen Honeydew. Beverly Hills Bunce, it was called. And he moved. Oh, yeah. He moved from Hill Street over to Beverly Hills, and he's this fish out of water. It was awful. <laughs> yeah. Awful. Yeah, it was like after MASH bad. All right, anything else, Leahy? That's it. That's it. I, I, Toledo, I need you to start writing this stuff down because there's no way that's all there was. I need Toledo to start. Uh, well, I mean, we went, on, we went on talking about music, and, I mean, Creed was really the only band that I wasn't familiar with there. Hey, Salehi, let me see if you get this. Mm-hmm. With arms wide open under the... St- no, nothing. He's blank still. He didn't even move the meter. No. <laughs> what else, Pete, Richard? Does your station uh, play that music still, by the way? No. Creed Owen. What, yeah, we do. We play Creed. A Creed song, and it's one of their... No, no, no. We got, we got three back in the mix right now. Oh, we don't do Arms Wide Open, though. We might do Can You, uh, can you Take Me Higher. Can my you own take me my own higher. Own prison. Yeah. Can you take me higher. Okay, I, that, song, that song does ring a bell. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, you've heard it. Can You Take Me Higher does ring a bell. Well, look it up. You might like it, but Scott Staff has a reputation of being kind of difficult. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> There's that. All right. Well, they were the Nickelback. Scott. They were the Nickelback. <laughs> they were the first Nickelback. Oh, boy. Okay. Yeah. They just got killed. Yeah. All right, we're on YouTube. We're linking to the YouTube uh, page from everything. Um, uh, F. Caliendo Live on Twitter. We'll have all that information. Toledo, you're working on updating, uh, keeping us alive on Facebook a little bit more there. Um, yes. We're trying to work on that. Uh, and um, 
And uh, we should have Shaq coming up, Shaquille O'Neal, for those of you who don't know uh, nicknames that well. Major Garrett, uh, who uh, John and I got mixed up with Edna Garrett earlier. Tony! <laughs> uh and uh the harlan Colin, coben episode which is probably going to be next week uh depending on how uh topical the shack and uh, uh major and Garrett jose is. i'm gonna go ahead and have you animate jerry jones swiping the life from gingers i'm just gonna make it my own Screw it. I'm, I'm 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 usurping you frank it's over no that's i want you to do that and i think you're talking about the shack one coming up as well which uh <laughs> hey, I, got the, uh, I don't know if i've I been got this. I got the Shack Daddy thing. Should I send it to Frank? Just so he could at least remember the Shack Daddy thing that you did. It was a uh, uh, was it Shark Daddy was originally. The oh no, baby, baby Shark, Baby Shark, we Baby did that. Shark. Yeah, that's ages. You did Baby Shark. No, this is a new thing. I think I was exposed to gamma rays or something. I'm coming up with the strangest acid trip ideas ever. So it's all for animating. All right, Perfect. so we're just working on getting that stuff all together. Uh, eventually, we will be a well-oiled machine, but as of hey, right now. So, so Leahy knew the original Dukes of Hazards. I, I had heard of it, yeah. Really? They made that movie with I'm sorry? Uh, Johnny Knoxville and uh, Justin Chicken Simmons. was in it. Chicken. Oh, that's right. Chicken, who passed away, uh, unfortunately. Michael Roof. Thing. Yeah, who was also in triple the original Triple X. Um, all right. And on hype. Bye. Bye. <laughs> That's it. And John's frozen. No, I'm not. No, he's faking. He's say. doing. He's doing a police squad ending. You're doing Katero. I was okay. waiting for credits. Hold on. That's how. Hold on. That's how we're ending it. Police squad. Any idea what that is, Salehi? No. Oh. No. He's most Looking people up. did. Naked Gun. Uh, Naked Gun two and a half. Look up those movies. You have to watch those movies. Naked yes. Gun two. The the scene that comes to mind is the umpire scene. Yeah. Yes. Enrico Palazzo. It was a TV show first. Really? Yeah. Okay. And, and you also have to look up Cop Rock now. Cop oh Rock. God! Don't do it too. Yeah. <laughs> I want book reports. I want a, I want Salehi's version of book reports on these old school TV video things. Yes. And. Uh, I can put that together. It, it, I, you won't believe what we were entertained by. <laughs> it's weird. You know what, Scott? I, as you said it, it didn't dawn on me, but Stephen Bochco did all of those. He did like, L.A. Law. He did L.A. Law. He did Cop Rock. He did NYPD Blue. He did Hill Street Blues. Like, you forget, he was behind all the cop dramas that changed everything and brought the wire right. around, really. He did. I, I, it, when he's you the said guy. Like, the Bochco thing, too. He's everywhere. No, he's, he's the guy. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm definitely happy to do these reports. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm finishing up classes this week, so uh, I'm going to have a lot. Of All right, that's what we're going to end up doing is we're going to have you do a, that's going to be a segment, a featured segment from yeah. you is going to be a weekly 70s, 80s, or 90s maybe update or uh, your update on uh, watching something. Okay. I think yeah. that's going to be key because I, I can't wait to see – We'll assign it an episode. We'll have a thing where he's like, I don't know what that is. All right, you got to watch the episode yeah. or blah, blah, blah. Like Gordon Jump rapes Dudley in different strokes called uh, The Bicycle Shop. You have to watch that. Okay. It nice. was Frank very... quoted that in the Shaq interview he did with the, on the podcast. He was yeah, like, I started yeah. singing. I started singing because uh, one of the guys on the show knows all the television theme songs. So oh, we right. started, now nah, the world don't move to the beat of just one drum. And I thought we had to get out of it. He kept going with it. Like yeah. I didn't know the rest of it. I was like, ah, well, it's your Don't show. screw with, between you and me and whoever that guy is, that could go on for days. Yeah. What yeah. if it was Shaq? What Shaq? <laughs> the Shaq's of life. The Shaq's of life. <laughs> All right. Let's see what we got here. Time you got to know you got to show and let you go. That would be great. <laughs> That's another one to animate where he's just in different wigs. <laughs> what are you doing, boy? He's all the characters. Tootie's going to lose her virginity tonight. We got to stop that. Tootie. <laughs> he brought up Tootie. Like, yeah. Jack Garrett. <laughs> oh, Kim Fields was hot. Yeah. I bet you he liked her. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm sure every, like, African-American kid, she was the girl. Like, like Blair was the girl for a lot of guys. And then I some like guys Jerry. like Joe. No, I actually like Joe. I, was, I, I did the, too. I was a Joe guy. Joe Polnicek. Until Jerry Jules. Well, it's kind of like Marianne and Ginger. Marianne uh, but that was Ginger. probably one of my favorites. Ginger. 
Are you yes. a Marianne or a ginger? <laughs> All right, well, we got to get out of here. All right, done. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Jeez. Daddy loves you. Bye. Yeah. Rack me. <laughs>